Good morning, folks. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. What I'd like to do right now is actually thank the rest of the steering committee who worked diligently this year and other years to put this conference together, and that's Mike Bettini and Tim Green, Melissa Parrott, and John Turner. I think they all deserve a good round of applause. <laughs> and forgive me if I start coughing, or I uh, caught that wonderful cold that my uh, wife and son have. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about, <clears throat> about the seals and the seal work that I do at Cubsock Beach. But I first want to talk to you <clears throat> about so the, a little bit about marine mammals in general here in New York. And we do have cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises here in New York. And we do have pinnipeds. And these are the, the marine mammals that exist here. Um, we've got about 20 different species of mysticetes and odontocetes. That's the, the baleen whales and the tooth whales. 20 out of the 84 known species in, in the world, which is pretty impressive. This is one of those horrible slides that, that no one can read. I just wanted to give you a sense. Um, many, some of these are year-round residents, are found here year-round, like fin whales. Others are nomads. Others migrate through our waters. And still others on occasion, like um, beluga whales, don't read the textbooks and don't know we're really not supposed to see them here. Just like some, I guess I could put manatees up there as well, because we do have manatees here. But I'm here to talk to you about, about seals. And I want to talk to you in general about seals before going in to talk about the specifics of what's happening um, at Cubsog Beach. So give you an idea, an overall view, there are 33 different species of pinnipeds in the world. They um, evolved about 25 million years ago and they share common ancestry with today's bears. There are three groups of pinnipeds. One group with just one species are the otobinids, the walrus. The walrus has an arctic distribution, but was found as far south as Cape Cod, but was hunted to extinction by 1800. There are 14 species of what we call the eared seals. And these include fur seals and sea lions. They have a decidedly Pacific Ocean distribution. So we're not going to find them here in New York unless we go to Manhattan or the Bronx or even Coney Island in the aquaria. I guess, are there any? I don't know if there are any out of the Riverhead Foundation. Sorry. Um, we have 14 species, I'm sorry, um, a pin of um, fur seals and sea lions, and then the true seals, otherwise known as the earless seals, and there are eight, 18 species of them. That's what we have here. This difference between eared seals and earless seals, it's a bit of a misnomer. All pinnipeds have ears. Eared seals have external ear flaps. And the other difference is, whoops, I did what everyone was doing yesterday. If we look here, this may be easier, the eared seals and the walrus can rotate their hind limbs forward and move on land on all four limbs, whereas true seals can't. They move on land on their bellies. Or if they're on ice, they can dig their nails into ice and pull. There's some other differences in terms of their, um, how they propel themselves through the water, but I think that's good enough. Yes, they are marine mammals, but all pinnipeds are tied to the land, and they're t or land or ice, and they're tied for two things. And by the way, this is um, at Cupsog about a week ago. Um, they're tied for birthing. They give birth on land or on ice, and for resting and socializing, a behavior we call hauling out. When, this is when the seals crawl out of the water onto things like sandbars, or onto rocks, or reed beds, or floating docks, or vessels. Forget the floating docks and vessels, all the other haul-outs um, are associated with tides. 
Most of the places here in Long Island, they haul out at low tide. In fact, at Cupsock, it's a low tide haul out. They begin to haul out normally about three hours before absolute low tide, and will stay out for six to eight hours. The seals in New York include these. 95% of the seals of Long Island are harbor seals. Well, that's the general number for all of Long Island, or that's an estimate. About 4% are gray seals, and the other 1% are made up of the Arctic seals. Although the story of Cub Sog is a little different. I've been um, monitoring the seal populations at Cub Sog since 2006. Actually, I actually did some in 2004. But since 2006, I've been there about 250 times and encountered, had t over 10,000 encounters with harbor seals, 78 gray seals, nine harp seals, one hooded seal. Which beneath that are, are the, the, the percentages, 99.1% harbor seal, less than 1% gray seal, even less than one tenth of 1% harp seal, and incredibly low of, of hooded seals at this point. So at Cub Sock, most of the time what we see are harbor seals. One of the things um, that might be a little biased, because I'm photographing these seals from five, at least right now, 500 feet away. And sometimes it's real easy to tell the species when I use a high-powered lens and zoom in. On occasion, they're so packed together that it's really difficult. So in fact, in this image, there is one individual that looks, what I could see of it, as a harp seal, juvenile harp seal. But I couldn't see enough of it to make that determination. But for the most part, this is predominantly harbor seals. So let me talk to you about harbor seals. Foca vitulina and the northwestern Atlantic harbor seal is a distinct population, a subspecies, um, Foca vitulina concolor. They are, um, this is the range. This is uh, given from uh, uh, the NOAA Fisheries um, stock assessment reports. And you see up to the north, if I can get this to work, this is their um, year-round range. And then what, what is depicted here is that the range given from September through May. That's pretty good, depending upon where you are on Long Island. Further east you go, they may stay a little longer and show up a little earlier. The earliest I've seen them was late August. And they may stay. Um, in some of the outer islands uh, through June and into July, except, and that's harbor seals. So we'll get to gray seals in a moment. Harbor seals. Dog-like in appearance in terms of their, their muzzle or their, their face. By the way, you can see right here, no ear flaps. Earless. Um, males get up to around 150 kilograms. Lengths are a little under two meters. Females about um, about 110 kilograms, so a bit less, but not a tremendous difference in in size between males and females. <sighs> yes, dog-like appearance, short muzzle, and one of the characteristic features, a little difficult to see here, is that when their nostrils are open, they look like this cartoon-shaped heart. As I said, they haul out on, 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 on um, sandbars and rocks, and they haul out in calm areas. It's incredibly rare to see these animals haul out in any significant number on open beaches. There's just way too much wave activity to interfere with their rest. <clears throat> the story has been, that, and it is true, that they are gregarious or found in large groups at, at haul outs, and that they travel alone. But I think, based upon, and this is kind of circumstantial, but you'll see perhaps they don't travel alone. And we don't have enough um, telemetry to, um, evidence for this. It would be a nice thing to look at. And I'll show you some that tend to always be together, show up at the same time, stay 
for the same length of time, and when they haul out, they're always next to each other. Some of these for 10 years in a row. How many are there in Long Island? We have no clue. Many of the things we have no clue about. They come to Long Island from the Gulf of Maine to spend um, part of the, obviously part of autumn, winter, and spring here because it is relatively less harsh than up to the north. How many are in the Gulf of Maine? The latest estimate, and this again from the NOAA Fisheries Stock Assessment Report, is about 80,000. And they're increasing at the rate of about 6.6% per year. Their lifespan, everybody asks, um, about 30 years. And if I get a chance to talk about this, you'll see it. Their, their mating system is a lek mating system. Lek mating system is one in which individuals of the same sex tend to aggregate in a place so that individuals of the other sex have a better chance of finding them. You guys recognize something like that in humans? <laughs> <clears throat> so, this is um, a view of, of, actually these are all males, hanging out together, and these recently hauled out, you see some are wet, and what they're doing is after they haul out, they sort of take this very vigilant uh, pose where they're keeping their eyes out and they remain in that vigilant state until they feel as if there is no threat and then they can kind of drop down and actually go to sleep sometimes. Sometimes they don't. So this vigilant state is one in which the head is up and the hind flippers are up and someone many years ago called this the banana position. And it works. <clears throat> it is a banana position. They can also be vigilant in the water. This is one of the ones, one of the ones that I call the patrollers. That when uh, they're in the water and are not sure if there's a threat or not, they will swim over towards where the where that threat might be and take a look. Now I'm doing this and I am, so I thought I was well hidden. Again, this is with a, a 600 millimeter lens, so I guess I wasn't that well hidden enough. So it was checking me out, sort of. <clears throat> they can rest on land, and when they rest on land, eventually when they sleep, both halves of their brain fall, are shut down, like politicians. Right? I won't tell you which party it is, but I, I think you might figure it out. When they rest in the water, they rest in this vertical position with their head up, and they shut down half their brain at a time, it's like the other members, the other politicians from the other parties. Um, so this is one doing that. This behavior is called bottling. Why is it called bottling? You see the Budweiser bottles? Actually, those are harbor seals. Although I once <clears throat> took a vessel full of people over to what I thought was a bottling harbor seal, and it was a Budweiser bottle. <laughs> you know, one of those little nibs? It was, not, it was embarrassing. <clears throat> These are animals that are adapted to live in an environment that removes heat 25 times faster than air. They're adapted to stay warm. They've got fur, they've got blubber, and they have this incredibly effective countercurrent heat exchange system that helps them stay warm when they need to stay warm. And they need to stay warm in the water, but where they're on land, they can overheat. What do they do if they overheat? One thing is to go back into the water. The other is to do what this individual is doing and that spread those hind flippers, a candelabra. The hind flippers have no blubber. The hind flippers are loaded with blood vessels. They act like a radiator. And they will dump heat and eventually clamp those, those, those flippers. This individual, fast asleep. 
right? Not a vigilant pose. This one, well, dumping heat, vigilant, eventually should settle down. Notice that these uh, don't have very, very distinctive markings, um, and partly due to, to the state they're in in terms of, of molting, but also there are some that don't. Harpercil young, feed on mother's milk for six weeks. Um, unlike any other seal, they can swim almost immediately after being born. The mating and pupping season occurs for harbor seals essentially from April through July. <clears throat> we can see this time of year some of the young ones sort of practice in courtship. We might be seeing courtship, um, but usually it's, it's not effective. And do they pup here in Long Island? No, typically they're gone, at least at Cubsog Beach, before they give birth. Many of the females that are there are pregnant, and it becomes more and more apparent as we get to this time of year, late March. Um, but it is incredibly rare. My colleagues at the Riverhead Foundation occasionally pick up um, newborns with the umbilical cords attached on occasion, but it's, a, it's a rare. We don't think no, that this is a regular occurrence. You know, we hear people say, oh, the seals are eating all the fish. I hear this all the time. They're eating all our flounder. Huh, not really. Um, they do eat, harbor seals can eat um, sort of up to 18 pounds of, of food per day. They will eat young ones right after feeding on mother's milk, will feed on um, crustaceans. And after that, they'll switch to fish. They're opportunistic feeders. They'll get fish and cephalopods, squid and octopus. But flounder in particular, I've heard people complain. There's very little data here from New York on the makeup of the diet of harbor seals. But this is data from up in Maine. And this is in the summer. And we see that, that uh, winter flounder in this, in this paper, and I'm sorry I don't have the reference here, makes up less than 1% of the diet of harbor seals up in Maine in the summer. A lot of it is hake. <clears throat> What's happening here? This is uh, about two weeks after Hurricane Sandy, and this harbor seal is chowing on a good-sized octopus. Took, took this individual a while to get it down. Actually, this is um, it, it's a male that I, I know from its marking. No, I know the male. Um, and we'll see in a moment who it is. <clears throat> People say they're cute and cuddly, right? Sure, they're cute and cuddly. No, they're not. They're wild animals. <laughs> not so cute, not so cuddly. This is one of the females that's been at Cubsock Beach now for 10 years, and they have these terrible manners. There are people looking at this one, and he's there peeing. <laughs> you ever wonder whether seals actually urinate on land or in water? I guess they may do both. But clearly, um, it does happen. And I get unfortunate when you're there enough, you get a lot of pictures like this. <clears throat> But they do some cool stuff, like some porpoising. Um, this is typically young males trying to uh, show off to females, maybe not so young males. This one, remember that one that was eating the octopus? There he is. His name is Horseshoe. And um, he's been at Cub Sog I, yeah, for about 10 years now. <clears throat> he's showing off. So let me talk to you about gray seals. Gray seals, giant, giant snout, big animals. 700 pounds for a male, about 500 pounds for a female. They mate and give birth from December through February. Do we know how many gray seals there are here on Long Island? No. In, the, um, in Canada, estimates are a couple of hundred thousand. Worldwide, around 400,000. Gray seals establish rookeries, colonies, where males, 
sort of protect a territory and therefore protect access to females, hence their large size. We thought that the closest colony was in Nantucket Sounds on Muskegon Island. And then in 2007, I, on a vessel, and a colleague of mine, Rob DiGiovanni, in an, in an aircraft, totally independently discovered what we think. Whoops, that's a female gray seal. The male is darkened. Um, sorry. I think I lost my slide. Um, this is a male gray seal, dark colored, um, large, big snout. He was at Kutsog. This is at 2007. He was there for 45 minutes doing what I call gray seal yoga. <coughs> Stretching. <clears throat> I can't do that. Uh, this is a female out there in plum gut, <clears throat> eating some kind of uh, clupia. No one can figure out what, what it is, but this is definitely a female gray seal. And plum gut is an area where lots of seals and where in 2007, uh, both of us thought we'd discover what is a, an incipient gray seal rookery or colony on Lilligal Island. The number of gray seals there have increased dramatically over the years, although no one has seen pupping. I still think it is, a, a, it is the largest at concentration of gray seals south of Cape Cod, <clears throat> and we think it is a, 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 a rookery. Um, if you look in Google Earth and zoom in on Lulagol Island, at least in the past, you would have seen this. And what you're seeing here and here are predominantly gray seals. That's a large number. If you look on Google Earth today, you won't see them. They're taken at a different time. But if you go back, let's say, to 2000 and maybe 11 or 12, or go back in time, you might see it. <clears throat> this is not a suggestion for all of you to head towards Little Gull Island. <clears throat> Please don't. I know you're thinking, okay, you know, if I take a kayak over there, that'll be okay, and it won't. They get more freaked out by kayaks when they're hauled out, because kayaks move at the same speed as their natural predator. I usually don't try not to tell people where this is, but I figured you folks would be OK. Usually I just say an, an outer uh, island, an eastern Long Island Sound. And then we have the Arctic seals, the ice seals, the ice-loving seals, harp-hooded and, and ring seals. Um, they spend summer in the high Arctic. And as we move close to the, um, as they move towards winter, autumn, they begin to move to the edge of the pack ice. And for the past 30 plus years, they've been expanding their range southward. Do we know why? Not a clue. Could it be food? Maybe. Could it be changes to the edge of the ice? The edge of the ice in the Arctic is changing more drastically than just about any other place on the planet because of warming, so maybe. <coughs> Hooded seals, males, 900 pounds. Females, 700, big. This is their uh, typical range in the, in the summer, in the high Arctic. But these ones travel pretty far. In fact, it's not on this map, but as far as south as Puerto Rico. And if you're a 900-pound hooded seal, you really shouldn't be in that really warm water. But they do, and we see them. I was going to tell, well, they're, they're called hooded seals because the males um, develop this large flap of tissue that it's a hood and they can blow it up. And that's to attract females. And they can blow out their nasal septum to produce this bloody looking balloon. And together, this is what um, females key in on in order to make some kind of mating choice decision. Not a pretty thing to us, but then, then again, we're not female gray seals. <clears throat> they're big. They have some. Uh, <laughs> their pups are born in spring. The pups feed on mother's milk for four days. And that's it. They double in weight from 45 to 90 pounds in four days. They have the richest milk of any mammal. 
And after four days, they're on their own. <clears throat> they feed on a variety of, of, of stuff. Um, of all the, the, the seals, all seals in, in the US are protected. The, the um, hooded seal has the relatively lowest um, numbers. And this is what I think is a juvenile hooded seal that we saw in January of 2008 over at Cupsaw. Still not entirely clear. Harp seals. You all know about harp seals. Adults have that, that large harp-shaped pattern on the back. The pups have white coats for their first 12 days. Those are the days where they feed on mother's milk. Harp seals, and this is the distribution, um, and this is the pupping areas. And the harp seals that, that come down here are those that are born here in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. <coughs> this is a harp seal at Cupside Beach. <coughs> they, they vary in, in markings from that white. They go to another phase you'll see here. Um, oh, maybe not. Sorry, I skipped something. Harp seals. Here's a, the, white, the white coats. And for decades, in fact, I've got data that you'll see in a moment for my entire life in which hundreds of thousands of these white coats are killed for their fur. Cute and cuddly, sure. Maybe not so much. This is a sealer taking the next stage, because now they can't take white coats. You have to wait till they're the next stage. And this is a hack -a pick up there. It's a bat with a nail. The objective is, after they dispatch the mothers, is to hit the pup in the head with that nail and kill it, supposedly instantly. Data shows it. Not always the case. <clears throat> As you can see. And then they get skinned. Why? Well, for apparel at one point, the quota this year and the hunt will start within the next, it started already in fact, typically takes place starting around mid-March. The quota for this year and as far back as 2011 has been a total allowable catch of 400,000. Why? There's no market left. There was a market, a legal market, a legal market in Taiwan. It's been illegal since 2011. It's been illegal in Russia since 2011. It's been illegal in the US since 1972. It's illegal in the European Union. Um, but there are some markets, unfortunately, in Asia. And then there are illegal markets. But this is entirely subsidized by the Canadian government to the tune of about Three and a half million dollars a year for no reason. Sorry, that's not nice. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of how far, how far back we can go, um, this is going back to 1952, where 300,000, every one of these years almost, we've got 100,000 or, or hundreds of thousands being killed. Recently, Last year, 54,000 out of 400,000. The year before, 90,000. Um, 2011, only, th only 37,000 were killed. That's because the ice front had melted back so far. So they actually upped the quota a little bit. Again, for no good reason. And of course, these seals, like other seals in, in the, the subarctic, um, are dealing with what's happening to the edge of the ice. 2012. We've got a 49% melt back in the summer sea ice. Luckily, in 2013, there was an increase. But right now, I just saw some data yesterday saying that this year's melt is the greatest loss ever recorded, greater than 2012. So what happens with this loss? These are seals, young seals, that spend their time, they're born on the edge of the ice, they stay on the edge of the ice, feeding on mother's milk for 12 days, they return to the edge of the ice, and sometimes they drown. 
In 2010, the harp seal pups in the Gulf of St. Lawrence didn't have to contend with being skinned. Almost 100% of them drowned because of um, a combination of warming in general and a very strong North Atlantic oscillation year. Oh, I know I haven't gotten to my data yet. This, guess what this is made out of? According to the advertisement, sustainable harp seal skins. This is a sustainably sealed egg chair being sold in uh, Copenhagen. But these are juvenile harp seals. There ain't no such thing as sustainable sealing. Seals here don't have to, be, don't have to be contend with being killed for their skins. Do have to be uh, concerned. We have to be concerned about entanglement from garbage. And this is one that's been at Cubsog for a few months now. Um, and it's being strangled here by lines. We do have to contend with being top relatively high level predators, biological magnification, and increased concentration of toxins, and being disturbed or harassed by people who don't know what they're doing or harass them on purpose. Uh, this is an overview of, of where the call out site is. It's um, across from the camping area right here, and it's varied. Back in 2006, they hauled out here. The sandbar itself has moved further away. It shifted to the west and is now turning and changing again. But these are the areas where I take photographs and where I <clears throat> to do my work and where I take people to observe harassment. This vessel, there were seals on that sandbar. This vessel came right up. Scared them all off. This is in the process of being scared off. And it was, they weren't doing this on purpose. I've seen other vessels directly go up and purposely uh, disturb them. But this does happen because these people were taking photographs. And they didn't realize that their presence would be disturbing. Just like people on the shore sometimes. <clears throat> and then we get this bozo for years flying over and uh, the seals would be flushed <clears throat> until finally I got a good enough lens to be able to capture that number on the vessel and uh, on, the, on the aircraft and send it off to the federal authorities. And that was the last time this aircraft was there. But I think this guy came back with another one. And then this went off to the feds. But this year, this was the, the, the winner. Um, November... We had two young harbor seals hauled out early November, and then these two idiots come up with their vessel up to the sandbar, scare the seals off, anchor on the sandbar, get out with shotguns, and begin skeet, practice, skeet shooting. Well, got a good photograph of the number, and they've been reported to the federal, the federal authorities who promised me the enforcement agent said he'll have to talk with them. Because I couldn't get a picture of them causing the seals to flush. Otherwise, there would have been a very severe consequence. <clears throat> this is a seal that Mike and I have photographed at Montauk Point probably for about seven years in a row. Although I haven't been there in a while. But this is one we recognized. and came back every year and recognized it by those markings. I'm sorry, not markings, by the, the, the ligature. It's being strangled by some kind of plastic. And I said there had to be a better way to identify seals and to show that seals are coming back. And I began doing some work at Cubsog Beach and using photo identification. I do this, we do this with humpbacks. We do this with fin whales. I know folks doing this with gray seals. <clears throat> at this point... Except for one person I know up in Maine who did this uh, sort of by hand, there's no one doing photo ID here in the U.S., at least on the east coast of the U.S., on harbor seals. No one but, but I. Um, and we can use this to, to look at ranging patterns, actually to make estimates of population size, but also to look at whether, in fact, they come back. 
what I began to do after looking at papers was um, to characterize them based upon the patterns. Some have dark skin with light spots, others have light skin with dark spots. Some have a combination. Some spots are regular, some are complex, some are dense, some not so dense. And began to do that and recording it for each one that I've got good images of. And I began to see that some had these really distinctive patterns. And it may be easier to identify them, very similar to what we do, let's say, with humpbacks. And this is one that I saw, and I called this one Y, because of this Y. And then um, I showed this to a group of students from Sable High School that I've been working with, and they said, no, 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 no. This is the USS Enterprise. And this one became Enterprise, and she's been there for 10 years. This is back in uh, about 2009, and here she is Monday of this week. <clears throat> and she is well swollen, well fed, and also pregnant. <clears throat> Here's one that, and I, I wasn't creative in the names, I call this one right two, two, one. Worked for me. They said no. See that? Those are the three atoms in a water molecule. And this became water molecule, right? Three-dimensional shape of a water molecule, the old Mickey Mouse thing. And, and this is water molecule, and she's been there for 10 years. These are the ones that are easy for me to recognize. <clears throat> there she is from Monday. Oh, you know what? You guys ever see a water boatman? The first name I gave her, not realizing it, was the same seal, was water boatman. She's also, this is triangle. And just kind of this whitish triangle. And I just recognize her for now 10 years. This is hammerhead right. Kind of hard to see in this angle, but there's this marking behind her right ear. And she's been there for 10 years. All right. Look, do you see a shopping cart? And this is on the um, <laughs> left side of the animal. So this became shopping cart left. Oh, this one. Now, this maybe sounds sexist, but this individual has five spots here and this line. And, and for lack of a better name, I first called it five spot, five spot cleavage. Well, that wasn't really good. And then I saw on the right side of its head, was this, so that was a V. And then we saw on the left side of the head another V, and it kind of looked like a fish, so that became fish V squared. Not a great name. And then here's diamond. They're all the same animal. Eventually I decided to call this one horseshoe. All the same, and horseshoe's been, it's a male, that's the male that you saw jumping before. Since 2009, every year. There's water molecule again. This uh, back in 2009, and she, I was on sabbatical in 2010, it may have been 2010, but I was on sabbatical to work on this catalog, and uh, there she is, also pregnant, and water, there's her, her marks right there. You see the um, paw print over here? This is paw print. All right. And there it is again. That was a while ago. It's been here now since 2008. There's hammerhead, right? Let me go through and um, show you some of the other individuals and then the data taken. Um, I like this one. Uh, see the Wicked Witch of the West? Riding on a broomstick? Um, <clears throat> Simon Templar, some of you will get it. Right? The saint? Right here? Some of you may not. I uterus and 
C-H-O. And a whole bunch of them have no names. All right, so what's going on? We've got um, five individuals that have been there for 10 years now. Two for eight, three for six years, one for five, one for four, seven been around for two years, and a whole lot of my 84 individuals have been there for one year, and these are all recent ones, and I haven't gotten past 2012 yet. I'm kind of behind. And what we've seen is a steady increase. Through 2011, <clears throat> well, 2009, there was dredging, a drop. 2011, steady increase. 2012, uh-oh, sandy and dredging and disturbance. And if I get rid of the disturbance, it's a beautiful linear association. But then, 2013, more disturbance, more dredging. 2014, more dredging. And now, 2015, the numbers are coming up. What this pattern represents is unclear. It's a lot of work to do. But it's eventually we'll figure out whether this uh, it, you know, this is only 10 years of work, so we've got some time, to, some time to do this. And the other thing that we can see, sorry, oh. <laughs> ah, it's gone. Um. Uh oh, I made changes. Um, what we see is the numbers increase dramatically through late March, then drop down. Oh, there it is in April, and then they leave. So just to give you a quick view, it won't work, of 193 har uh, seals, not coming up. This is the work that's going on. Um, come out with me. You can see them. Uh, you can help out in this. And if you are there and, and photograph seals from a distance, you can share those photographs with me. Thank you. You guys have um, any questions already? We have time for a couple questions. Yeah. Thank you, Artie. I'm curious about the predation. Have you seen any signs of any predation of our seal colonies? Um, no, I haven't. Now, their, case, their predators are, are killer whales and, and um, great white sharks. I used to think now we won't, great white sharks aren't there when these seals are here, but they are. And some of the tag ones are seen right off um, uh, Quag in, in, um, a couple of years ago. But no, no evidence of predation that I can see. The markings, you see some that, oh, I'm sorry, I do see on occasion shark bites. Take it back. Um, on occasion, you see individuals with, with injuries, but those are males, and those are injuries from contests with other males. But yes, occasionally we see some with shark bites, absolutely. Um, but help, not a, a tremendous percentage. Okay. 